Washington football. Woo! Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Burgundy Zone. I am your host, Kyle, and I'm joined by my co-host, Michael Hall. Hopefully, Reed will come by here soon and be able to join us. He's in but ghost mode right now. He is in ghost mode. The Burgundy Zone is a part of the Frederick Podcast Network. You can find out more by going to www.listenfrederick.com. But now we are rejoined by Lake Lewis on this fantastic and beautiful Monday evening. How are you doing tonight, sir? I'm good. I appreciate you guys having me back on. Uh, yes, sir. And like, I got to get your opinion on this because uh, Twitter has been up in riots the past, uh, I guess, 12 hours. What is your opinion of the games yesterday? I thought it was fantastic football besides the fact that the Eagles got gifted a Super Bowl run with uh, injuries to quarterbacks. I mean, how crazy was to those two games yesterday? Yeah, I mean, I think they were definitely on the entertaining side. I mean, the Cincinnati Kansas City game was great. I mean, that was that was good football. If that's what you're looking for. Um, you know, two great quarterbacks making plays when they had to. And obviously we know, you know, the Eagles game, San Francisco game, you didn't get a chance to see, uh, you know, top flight quarterback play because Jalen Hurts didn't have to do much because, as you mentioned, 49ers besieged by injuries and the way their season started is the way their season ended. Yeah. Uh, but overall, you know, I, I, I'm looking forward to the Super Bowl. I think we've got two two really good quarterbacks. And I, and I think for, you know, a guy like Jalen hurts, you know, for him to have a chance to be the Patrick Mahomes, uh, you know, I think that'll, that'll, that'll signal literally his arrival in the NFL. I think a lot of people have been skeptical about him all year, you know, as far as his play and what he didn't have to do, but I think people have to understand the Eagles wouldn't be in the Super Bowl if Jalen hurts wasn't behind center. Yeah. I totally agree with you there. I think the one thing about Jalen Hurts is that he's always calm, cool, and collected. He was one of my favorite quarterbacks in that draft. They did a good job of doing that because he was, as much as you want to give him crap about the offense yesterday, they won the football game. Um, but let's talk, I want to get your opinion because who gets a deal in this offseason? As of right now, Washington is projected to have $32 million in cap space after they release Carson Wentz, which ranks 16th in the NFL. That's that's only a little bit of change when you consider the fact that Deron Payne's looking for a deal, Cam Curl's looking in the, uh, looking for a deal in the near future as well. So what do you think happens? Who gets a deal in this offseason? Well, I think what you do before you have to, you know, split your brains is if I was a GM of this team, I'd make sure that – instantly Deron Payne knows he's going to get franchised. Um, I mean, there's, there's no way I'm letting him walk out the building, um, you know, and, and you can franchise them this year. You maybe even do it again next year. Um, and then maybe you focus on a cam curl because let's face it, Deron Payne's deal has to be a massive deal. I mean, he's a pro bowl uh, D tackle, you know, 25 years old. I mean, you, you just, you don't see players of this magnitude become available on the market this early in their careers. Um, and if you're Washington, he, he's an intricate part of what you do. You know, he's, a, he's one of your faces. And I think that, you know, it's okay for them to understand that perhaps they gaffed and, and taken, um, you know, the kid Mathis from Alabama. And, and I think when they took him, there was every indication for him to push and maybe even push out Deron Payne. And obviously we know about the injury um, to Mathis first game of the season. And then Deron Payne had the best year of his career. So, um, you know, it's okay. He, he had the best year of his career. There's nothing wrong with that. So now you, you sign him and you pay a lot of money for it, but at least you know that your, your, your key pieces, so to speak on defense, especially on that D line will still be intact for yet another year. And I think if you're, if you're this team, you franchise him and then maybe you use the other money to uh, re-sign Cam Curl. But I think Cam Curl is one uh, in excess of 80 million. So it's going to be intricate. Uh, interesting to see how they pull all this off. Yeah, I uh, definitely agree. Um, just speaking about Cam Curl, if you look at the defensive numbers and just the defense as a whole with him on the field and with him off the field, I mean, it's going to be hard to kind of uh, let a guy walk like that. So definitely the, hope they can get him resigned. But speaking of a guy like Deron Payne, if you go back two years ago, Jonathan Allen seemed mm -hmm. like had his breakout year. Then you uh, get to this year, Deron Payne seems like he had his breakout year this year. Who do you think is poised in uh, 2023 that's on the roster right now to kind of make that jump and be the uh, breakout player for the same? 
I mean, they, they've got some nice young pieces in play. And, I, and you know, for me, a guy like Benji St. Juice, you want to say he has a breakout year, but I think he already had it. I think he was having it this year before he got injured. Um, there's a lot of players that were that were having really good years before the injuries. I mean, Cam Curl, I think sometimes when you think about the rookie campaign and how it just flashed and jumped out, and I think it did because people weren't expecting it to be of that level. And then if you look at the last two years, I mean, he's he's had Pro Bowl caliber seasons, but injuries obviously have cost him of that. So maybe you can say it's Cam Curl next year. He puts together a complete full season and he gets a Pro Bowl trip. He's definitely got that kind of talent. Um, you know, maybe Montez Sweat. Montez Sweat had the best year of his career this year, if you ask me. And, uh, you know, could have had maybe three or four more sacks where he was just maybe seconds away from finishing a play. You know, maybe he's the guy that next year that does that. Um, Jamin Davis, I, I think he had a very good year this year compared to, you know, people were calling him a bust. You know, why? I don't know. But people were saying, you know, he he wasn't living up to the hype and living up to that first round status. Well, I think this year he had a really strong year. And this was, in fairness to Jamin Davis, the first full season for him, you know, in one position. <laughs> and I think he benefited from that. So. I know I'm getting long-winded, guys, but I think yeah. there's three or four players that could have breakout, quote-unquote, years next year, and hopefully they happen at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Benjamin St. Juice definitely showed that when he was starting, showing that he was a number one corner and he could strap up. I loved what he showed, and obviously he has to be more consistent with it, but I'm sure that he will be looking forward. But now my next question for you, let's talk about the offensive coordinator search. Uh, there's been a lot of speculation floated around People are saying that it's probably going to be Ken Zampese or uh, Coach Ken Zampese, who's already the QB coach. There's even theories of Eric Bieniemy, and the commanders are waiting for Bieniemy to become available once their playoff run ends. What, what's your dream scenario, and do you think that Bieniemy is actually possible of obtaining? Yeah, I mean, it's going to be tough right now because, you know, the, the sale of the team is looming and you know, you don't want to say Ron Rivera and Martin Mayhew and those guys are sitting ducks right now or lame ducks, but I'd be hard pressed to think that uh, if they do have, uh, you know, a sell announced sooner than later, let's just say by the league meetings, it's, you know, if there's certain coaches that are out there, you know, a new owner would do their best to do their due diligence on perhaps bringing in their own people. And if that's the case, then, you know, it's going to be hard for them to fill that spot right now because, let's face it, a lot of these guys know what's going on here. They know that there's talent in the building as far as from a player standpoint, especially at the wide receiver position, running back positions. And, and, and I think some of them even saw a little bit of a flash from Sam Howell in that final game against Dallas. But let's face it, if you're looking for a job, is this the place you want to land with, the, with so much uncertainty because you could get in here with all intentions of being, you know, the offensive coordinator or whoever, and you may be here for a month <laughs> and new ownership comes in. I mean, there's really no precedent set for this under these circumstances. Um, so I think that that's going to be a tricky thing for me, my ideal scenario. I, I mean, I like Anthony Lynn. I really do. I like him a lot because he was a former head coach. And I think that he's a guy just, just from my two cents here, I, I think the Chargers did him wrong. I, mm -hmm. I did not like how they, you know, handled his whole situation and replaced him uh, with Brandon Bailey. But with all that being said, I think Eric Bieniemy would be a really nice hire for them at, at the offensive coordinator position. Obviously, we know what he's done with the Kansas City Chiefs. And, you know, there, there's two sides to every story. And there are going to be people out there that say, oh, he's only been good because of Andy Reid. And he's only been good because of Patrick Mahomes. And that's doing him a disservice because let's face it, if it were, you know, any other person that would have been Eric B enemy, he'd be a head coach right now, somewhere around the league. Um, but with all that said, I think Eric B enemy would have to really ask the same question. You know, is this a lateral move? Because if he's coming here to be, uh, you know, uh, the offensive coordinator, he's clearly going to have to be associate head coach as well in order for it not to be a lateral move. And I think that some people have to understand too, that, does Eric Bieniemy have full 100% authority to call the plays in Kansas City? And I don't think he does. And I'm not saying that's an issue because obviously it's worked for their success. But Andy Reid does have a lot of say on the offense. There. I think if Eric Bieniemy were to be given the offensive head uh, uh, coordinator position here in D.C., 
he would have to make that decision based on if they're going to give him total autonomy to call the offense and, 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 and sculpt and mold it the way he sees fit. And if that's the case, if they do offer him that, then I think that that's something that he will consider. Yeah, and definitely. I remember first time I saw Eric Bieniemy was um, a rook- welcome to the NFL rookie with Adrian Peterson. So obviously yeah. he helped coach him as a as a rookie. So we could talk about Pat Mahomes and Andy Reid all day, but obviously Eric Bieniemy produces it, whatever job he's given. There's production in it, and that you can't you can't lie about it. Sorry, Hall. Yeah, and he's a, and he's a former player too, and I think there's something to be said about that. Um, you know, as a former athlete, uh, I've I've always said, you know, I'll listen to a coach that hasn't played all day, but you kind of listen a little bit more when the guy's been in the trenches and done it. Mm. Um, you know, you yeah. can kind of you kind of can respect that a little bit more, and especially if they've had success. And, and I think if you're a guy like Sam Howell, you you want an Eric Bieniemy in the building because let's face it, he's he's coaching one of the goats right now mm-hmm. at the position, and you know the the numbers don't lie, the results don't lie, and the other thing I do like about Eric Bieniemy is Eric Bieniemy is not a guy that's afraid to get in your face. And you know, let's let's call it like it is. I, I, Ron Ron's a good man. Um, he knows that I feel about that way about him, but he also knows one of the things that I can't stand about him is the, the arms crossed on the sidelines when you're getting the hell beat out of you. Um, sometimes I need a little bit more fire, and and I know Eric Bieniemy will give you a little bit of that. Uh, and and the offense at times has needed some fire and they didn't bring it. So let's mm-hmm. let's let's go with that. Yeah, no, I agree. I think that uh, the enemy would be a home run hire for this uh, coaching staff. Just for, like you said, given his track record and what he's been able to do with the Chiefs. But uh, sticking with the offense and it wouldn't be Washington unless we talked about the quarterback position. So uh, it's kind of a two part question. What are your thoughts on them saying uh, telling people potential offensive coordinators that is that Sam Howell is their quarterback one going into the season. And the two the second part of the question is, um, it kind of seems like Tom Brady is going to be out of Tampa Bay, maybe moving to the AFC. seems like the Packers are going to move on from uh, Aaron Rodgers in the AFC. Dallas just lost their offensive coordinator and Kellen Moore to the Chargers. And outside of Philly, and maybe we'll see what uh, the 49ers do with the quarterback position, it kind of seems like the NFC is, I'm not going to say wide open, but it's definitely not as top heavy as the AFC. So my second part of the question is, do you think that they should take another swing on a vet quarterback, maybe a guy like a Derek Carr, and to come in here in Washington? Or do you think they should uh, stick with the plan that they have out there and roll with Sam Howe? Uh, Great questions. Um, And, yeah, there's definitely going to be a lot of change in the AFC, you know, as far as the power brokers, uh, quarterbacks moving around, musical chairs. Listen, for me, I I tweeted this out recently. I'm sticking with it until somebody proves me wrong. If I'm running this team, there's only one player that I'm I'm going all after with everything that I have, every dime I have in the bank that's available to be spent, and it's Lamar Jackson. <laughs> for me, it's a no-brainer for this organization to do something that they haven't done, frankly, and that's invest in the position where you you feel like you're investing in it. Let's let's be honest; they pay Carson Wentz a lot of money, but. How many people can honestly raise their hand and and say when that money was spent, it was 100 percent guarantee that everybody was all on board for Carson Wentz to be the guy to to fix the problem that's been ill for this organization for the last 20 years? I'm sipping my tea, Lake. Of course. Thank you. Not let, with, with me saying that, let me get some water. Oh. There's, there's no way any of us signed up for that and, and thought that. Um, do we think that he could be? slight upgrade um, to what they had perhaps if he played his best football and that still was a an if right. well you're telling me that if you can give Carson Wentz 32 million dollars you can't give 13 more to get a guy like Lamar Jackson who at 26 has already been a league MVP who at 26 still has you know is must see TV every time he steps on the field and let's be honest and let's be fair here before people throw Lamar Jackson under the bus and say he can't read defenses, he doesn't win, false. He absolutely does win. When he was on under center for this team, they were a lock to make the playoffs this year. And then when he got injured, we saw what happened. And also, Lamar Jackson has never had the same amount of talent on offense that Patrick Mahomes, Josh Allen, Joe Burrow, that uh, any of these guys have. Hell, I'm going to say this. 
he hasn't had the amount of talent on offense that Taylor Heineke and Carson <laughs> Wentz had yeah. right yeah. here this year. And if you put him under center with those weapons on the outside and those and the running backs that they have on this team, I think he would make a poor offensive line look pretty good. And I, that's the guy that I would go all out. And I think if Washington somehow found a way to land Lamar Jackson without betting the farm, I, I would give up every draft pick I have, except for I wouldn't add any players in. This roster right now with that man under center is a Super Bowl contender yes, overnight. Sir. And I truly believe that. My man, that's why I like having you on here, Lake. Now, to wrap this up, <laughs> I only have a couple more questions for you. But uh, Washington is losing Chris Harris to the Tennessee Titans uh, to go there. What are the expectations for the new hire? Do you expect it to be from within? And how difficult of a job is that going to be for Rivera and company and being able to replace Harris? Because those are big shoes to fill. I mean, those are big shoes to fill. And he's, again, he's one of those other guys that was a rah-rah type coach, you know, a lot of energy. Uh, you, you know, you just think about the training camp and, and seeing him running all over the field, chest pumping his players. And they responded to that. So, you know, definitely a blow for them on the defensive side of the ball. But, you, you know, it's next man up. And, you know, there's some there's some candidates, and I'm sure, in-house that you take a look at. Um, but for me, you probably have to step out of pocket again and um, and bring in someone. And, and, and I think in this situation, you may want to confer with some of your players, too, because I, I think what we've seen over the past several years, not just here, but a lot of guys have been coming up from the college ranks, mm. uh, you know, filling those spots, especially back in the secondary. So, you know, there may be a, a hot name out there or someone out there that, that potentially has a chance, uh, you know, to, to, to come aboard. And, uh, you know, we saw the Giants do it before. Agreed. Yep. Yep. So, you know, I, I listen, it crossed my mind. It absolutely <laughs> crossed my mind. Um, and, and it depends on who your next coach is. I, yeah, I tell you sure. what, if, if Eric B enemy comes here somehow as coordinator, don't be surprised if you do see an Ed Reed, someone that he's familiar with, you know, get a look. Um, it, they, they want to make sure they get this right though. I mean, this is a very precarious time for Washington. And it is. if you remember Vera, you can't do the buddy system on this one, this this go around, because mm. your your livelihood is riding on this. If you bring in the right people and let's just say you are around for this next year, you are being judged. This is it's one and for you if you don't get it done. You might not even make it through one and done if you're not getting it done. But if you bring in the right people, this could be something where maybe you salvage your job for new ownership and you can stick around here for a while, a lot longer. Yeah, totally agree. Thank you, Lake. I really do appreciate you coming on here and sharing your thoughts with us as always, sir. It's been a fantastic Monday and you provided some great insight for us. I hope you have a good night, brother. And until next time. I appreciate you guys having me on. And uh, I'm a little burnt, just got back from vacation. So there you go. Enjoy I, that. I'm red. I was peeling. So I just had to get you prepared for you, but I appreciate you having me on. <laughs> well, hopefully the Eagles join you on vacation here soon in very unhappy manner, Lake. That's what we all can <laughs> hope on. Have a good one, Lake. All right, take care, guys. Appreciate you. All right, everybody. We just spoke with the man, Mr. Lake Lewis. I always enjoy having him and listening to Lake. He does bring a different perspective. I know we've heard a lot about the Lamar Jackson um, aspect of it, and I and I totally do I get it because I, I'm right there with you. Like he's he's one of the only ones where you you get the guarantee of play and production, and also with the youth and age. But obviously, there's a lot that comes with it, meaning that the draft capital and the money cash that you'd have to allocate for Lamar, and that's that's a heavy task. But that's why they call us the big leagues, baby. Yeah, I mean, look. I know people are like so set on like, no, we need to draft our own guy. And I mean, everyone always says I wouldn't want another team's trash. Like, and well, why didn't the Ravens pay him and blah, blah, blah. Like, like Lake Lewis said, he's a league MVP, prior league MVP, unanimous MVP at that. And he's a showstopper, electrifying player. And at the end of the day, guess what? Even if Sam Howell works out and pans out, you still got to pay him if he pans out and ends up being the franchise guy. So at some point in this Washington tenure, they're going to have to get a quarterback and pay him. Why not get a guy that's already been an MVP and just throw the bag at him that the Ravens won't throw at him. So I would love that move, but again, this is wishful thinking, but you never know. It's a crazy yeah. league. And these sort of deals always seem to always 
always seem to look like they are done ahead of time, if that makes sense. Exactly. Kind of like Kellen Moore going to the Chargers today. He was on (laughs) the market for, what, a week? And just all, like obviously they already had that chimed up, but I got to get Man. your uh, your opinion on this question. This is from the Colonel who sent me this in through text. Mel Kiper has mocked Broderick Jones, offensive tackle out of Georgia, to us at number sixteen. Jones didn't allow a single sack as a left tackle in 2022. Reed would be very disappointed. Do you see him <laughs> falling that far? And would we take him over Christian Gonzalez if available at sixteen? Um. It's a good question. Um, if he's available at 16 and Gonzalez is at 16, um, it's a good question because I think it really depends on how they view Charles Leno and can he be the guy for this year and maybe the year after that going forward? Or it's kind of like how do they view the cornerback position as in like Benjamin St. Juice? Obviously, he looks like he can be a number one guy if he can do it consistently and obviously stay healthy. And then obviously you have a guy like Kendall Fuller who's getting up there in age, but is still a solid uh, guy on the other on the opposite field. So me personally, I would probably go with the offensive tackle just because that's a little bit more, more, uh, more uh, cost effective. Cost effective, and also it's more of like a as far as like position ranks go, that's like it ranks a little bit higher than cornerback right now. Obviously, it's a passing league, and you can never go wrong with having too many. Uh, top-notch solid corners on your on your roster but if we want to actually get a quarterback in Washington and have a quarterback for the long term in Washington obviously offensive line was one of the biggest needs for this team this off this whole season and I think a guy like uh Jones from Georgia could definitely be the uh we had Chris Samuels we had Trent Williams maybe it can be that next guy in that lineage of uh left tackles for us so I would like to pick uh the guy from the kid from Georgia I would not. Um, he's 6'4", 310 pounds. Um, I don't think that his body structure is set for the NFL. Uh, you kind of look at the guys from yesterday rushing the passer, and that's the kind of power you're going to have to be able to stand up against. And sitting at 310 pounds, you need him to add weight. He's very thin-waisted. It's very, actually incredible how big he is in the lower body. But he does have to get bigger. I think he projects better as a guard. Um, so Pro- Broderick Jones, I'm not sure at 16 is the best fit for him there because I feel like getting your starting left tackle is going to be very hard to do in this draft unless you're in a, a really good situation with like Anton Harrison I think it's somebody who could come right in and play left tackle in this league but I feel like uh, Broderick Jones has a ways to go he has things he has to correct and I would be concerned about getting him at 16 unless you know that that's your starting left guard then I'm 100% for it you know what I mean but I do think there's a ways to go with him being a left tackle and I don't want to thrust him into that position and then him getting whooped all year and asking oh well that was that was stupid to be able to do that you know what I mean but obviously him coming from Georgia very very good he's going against the best of the best but I just feel like there's other um prospects prospects there that project better as left tackles going forward in the NFL but now we are joined by our next guest Mr. Matthew Paris of the Washington Times how are you doing this evening sir what's up Matt how you doing can you hear us? Yeah, sorry, my I had my uh, headphones plugged in at my desk. <laughs> <laughs> that was really, really awkward for whoever is at your desk. Um, <clears throat> but uh, to start off this Monday, sir, I got to get your opinion because you came out with a piece last week regarding Cameron Curl and his kind of impact on this defense and it was fascinating this past season because we saw it in real time you know he wasn't there for the first four games comes in then also he's injured at the end of this season so you, you get a good scale of how much how much of an impact Cam Curl had please give us what you found yeah uh it's just really a matter of if they try and re-sign Cam Curl this offseason or sign him to an extension what are they going to pay him you know you think about the contract that Washington played, paid Landon Collins a few years ago. That was six years, $84 million. I think it's a $14 million average. Seven safeties have topped that mark since then. And so, you know, I, I don't necessarily know if Cam Curl is the best safety in the league. Like I said, Derwin James, he makes $19 million. But I think he's probably about that $14 million range or above that even. It was funny, today his father tweeted out the story and said that uh, yeah, it has to be at least twenty million, <laughs> and so it was. Uh, he caused a little bit of a stir with that. So 
Uh, we'll, we'll see how the contract negotiations go. Rivera has been very tight-lipped about this, whether they even plan to, to make an offer or anything like that. He doesn't want to give leverage to the player's agent. That That's his rationale. But uh, it's pretty fascinating because, you know, they gave up about a touchdown more per game without him, which is a little bit of that was early because the defense was still sorting itself out. But mm. when he, you know, missed those games late in the year too, uh, those final five games or those final three games with that ankle injury, uh, the defense started to fall off again. So he makes a big difference. Yeah, definitely does. Like Kyle said, we saw it in real time where it was almost like night and day whenever he was on the field and off the field. You could uh, definitely tell the difference. Um, getting back uh, with the off season, you mentioned Cam Curl and possibly uh, the extension that might be coming his way. A guy like Deron Payne is due for some money as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're gonna. I got to figure out what they're gonna do with Montez Sweat eventually as well. Yeah. Um, there are some holes on this team, like offensive line, cornerback depth. What do you think priority number one outside of finding an offensive coordinator? What do you think priority number one is for this team this upcoming offseason? Yeah, on the field. I mean, outside of the, the sales stuff, um, I I think the first priority is just what are you going to do at quarterback? I feel like they know they've been telling teams that. Uh, Sam Howell is going to likely be the starter. He's still going to have to earn it through the process. So what does that look like in terms of actually bringing someone in to compete with? Is it going to be, um, you know, a Jacoby Brissett type, Andy Dolan, like a, a veteran who in theory may be able to bring, beat out Sam Howell, but you would I really like to see him win that job. Um, beyond that, I think the biggest priority itself is the offensive line. You know, the reason why, that group really regressed last year is because of the moves they made previously. And so what seemed like a huge strength heading into the season actually turned out to be uh, a huge weakness. So they've got to figure that out. And then uh, Deron Payne to me is a big question. Uh, do they go the franchise tag route? Do they try and extend him to a long-term deal? I mean, they made the decision last year not to pay him at a career year. Now they're in this boat of, um, having to decide what to do but i think the franchise tag just speculating makes a lot of sense yeah and then have you heard anything um as of late about federian mathis and his rehab and how he's doing yeah we had a chance to talk to uh federian on locker room clean out day and he said he's his rehab was really coming along well he was about i think a week or two from really kind of ramping up his actual rehab but he was feeling a lot better he was coming along gradually so um he was in a good place i think he'll be full go by otas or at least part of it um you know it was a torn mcl i believe that's i think that's right so um you know sideline him for the season but uh, i think you know that that's what hurt washington is they drafted Mathis to be that succession plan for right. pain. They didn't really have the chance to evaluate on the season to see if he could be. So maybe it's worth rolling it back another year, seeing if pain is able to match that type of projection production again on a franchise tag and see where Mathis is a year later. Yeah. Um, this past weekend, uh, Ian Rappaport, or I guess it was yesterday, Ian Rappaport tweeted out that Washington is interested in uh, Eric Bieniemy from the Kansas City Chiefs. Um, I would love that hire. Uh, what was your what would be your opinion of the hire? And do you think it is a on a scale of one to ten? Uh, do you think it's a possibility? I do think it's a possibility. I've heard the same. Um, I would say he's on their radar now that the Chiefs have made the Super Bowl. I, I don't know necessarily what it would look like in terms of timing. Washington has been very, very patient with this offensive coordinator search. They want to talk to Anthony Lynn. As well, and I think what's been interesting about their search is that a lot of the candidates don't fall in that Eric Coriel like tree that Ron Rivera has used all throughout his coaching career since becoming a head coach. Um, so, how open are they to actually different schemes? Eric Bieniemy has had uh, success running Andy Reid's kind of West Coast offense. Now, I think why the job would be appealing to Bieniemy is that this would be a true opportunity for him to call plays. He only does it a little bit in uh, Kansas city. He hasn't really been able to consistently do it. That's been a knock on him. Why he hasn't been able to get the head coaching job. He's more than qualified for this position. I mean, (laughs) we can talk about whether he should be a NFL head coach or not, but you know, I think it, honestly, I think this job would be a little bit of a risk for him, especially if he has 
other interests from i think the key thing about rapport's tweet is that the ravens yeah the titans and uh you know the jets filled their position but they were interested in him as well so if he has legitimate options here then maybe it's hard to see him coming here but um i do think it makes sense given the familiarity um rivera was a coach when bnme and bnme's final year as a player with the eagles so it, it makes a lot of sense I, I don't know how well they actually know each other um but it it's very interesting I, I, it's it's more of an intriguing name than like pat Shermer or kind of you know mm-hmm. retreats like that right and apparently rex ryan saw a bunch of feet over the weekend because he was very excited <laughs> and he decided to say that he thinks that you everyone should be eyeing and watching out for the commanders and obtaining tom brady and sean payton i mean is have you heard anything about that matthew because i'm obviously us as fans it's something we would like to know about because this is something that's being speculated how much should we take that with a grain of salt and how big of a grain of salt uh the biggest grain you can find i think <laughs> You know, it's funny, Seth Wickersham actually said something uh, more like along those lines, but he didn't use Sean Payton. He used Bill Belichick as the could Brady Belichick reunite in Washington. And it was more so speculative of, you know, if Kraft and Belichick get tired of each other, where's Belichick going to go? Okay, maybe Washington with a new owner. But the ownership thing is really key in this, and it hasn't progressed to the point where, you know, if they're really going to make a, let's, let, let's say Rex Ryan plugged in these songs, which are, it's not just speculative. They would have to act like that on an ownership change right. uh, to get the new owner in place. Um, a buyer, you know, a new owner just isn't going to come in and say, all right, we can get Sean Payton and see you later on Rivera. Like, they take time to evaluate things. It's That's the hard part, I believe in. The Brady stuff, I mean, hell, I think Ron Rivera would love to have Brady, but who wouldn't? Um, <laughs> just, you know, Giselle probably. <laughs> Would it be left foot up for Rex Ryan and the Commanders? Or yeah, I know. <laughs> what is up I like with that? That, <laughs> that was great. That's funny. So funny. I forgot my question. Um, <laughs> Paris uh, getting Hall off track. You want me to go? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. I forgot. What I was gonna um, say. I want to get your opinion at sixteen. Um, because obviously you've talked about being one of the off season issues being that Washington needs to be able to refill that offensive line that being said they only have 32 million as of right now if they were to release Carson Wentz and the cap has now moved up to 224 million but that puts them at 16th in the NFL it's hard for them to add a lot of guys to this roster given the fact that Deron Payne's still here we talked about Cameron Curl so at 16 what do you think Washington should do with that yeah, uh, well, full disclosure, I haven't really dug into the draft necessarily yet. In That's terms fine, just of like positional. I'm, I don't want you to tell us yeah. players. Yeah. yeah, position, I think two really make sense for the draft. One is the offensive line. Find the best offensive lineman you can. Honestly, even if a, a, if a left tackle is there, as well as Charles Leno played uh, this past season, um, you know, I, I think it's worth – taking a look at it at the very least because left tackles are harder to find. You can find a star quality one and Charles Leno can be released, I think, and they save 8 million. So that, that would be a, a decent chunk of change. Um, beyond that, beyond, uh, I think guard really kind of makes more sense or center, even if you're talking about the interior, but maybe you can find that later in the draft, but beyond the offensive line spots, cornerback is a real big one, you know, the William Jackson signing didn't really work out. They released him mid or traded him last season. Um, Benjamin St. Juice showed a lot of problems, but he's gotten hurt. They kind of need that number one tier option of cornerback. Kendall Fuller played better as the year went along. He had those two pick sixes, which are really impressive. But I mean, if they can solidify that spot, I think that's kind of, you know, you're taking what are the positions on their board that are really of value um, cornerback makes a lot of sense to me yeah i agree with you there now to wrap this up paris i only have a couple more questions for you but let's just say looking at this team going forward we're, we kind of want to gauge what washington is going to do right in this offseason because we talked about the 32 million just let your this isn't guaranteed but in your per, your p- opinion your prediction who do you possibly could be a cap casualty for washington to save money or restructure they don't have to be released but even restructure the, the two most interesting to me are Chase Roulier. You know, they could save, I believe, about just 
around five million dollars. Um, I think four point seven. If they release him, he's had two back-to-back season injuries. He's actually a really good player when healthy. It's just a question of can he stay healthy. Rivera mentioned center is a priority for Washington um, to figure it out at his season and in press conference. So maybe he comes back at a lower reduced rate or they just clear him out completely. That would make sense. Another one to me is Logan Thomas. You know, they can say $5 million there. He had a very disappointing year by his standards statistically. Now you've got to give him some leeway because – one, he was coming back from that ACL injury, and that's always hard to do. And then two, they fired Scott Turner. So, you know, maybe they just weren't happy with the way that they were using their tight ends. But $5 million is still $5 million. That's a decent chunk of change you can clear. Um, but for me, it's the question of, all right, if you do that, who's going to replace him? John Bates, Amarni Rogers, Cole Turner. That's a very, very unproven group, and they've struggled without Logan Thomas. Yeah, I would agree with you there. Now, my last question for you <clears throat> Now let's talk about, oh my goodness, I just lost it, and I have it written down here and everything. Oh, backup quarterback, because okay. like this team has obviously gone through quarterbacks. We can go down the list of the past four years. It's a laundry list of quarterbacks. We need consistency here, and obviously Sam Howell is the only one that's going to be most likely on the roster. What are they going to do with backup quarterback? Do you think that they're only going to keep two on the roster next season, or do you, you expect them to go after two more quarterbacks to add here? Yeah, I mean – Shoot, we'll see. I if they they would probably sign someone and then maybe they draft another late round to to carry on the roster. It doesn't necessarily seem like they'll spend you know or sign two backup quarterbacks and make it kind of a, a three man competition. I think I see what you're if Sam Howell is going to compete with someone. It, it'll be you know it's not going to be Case Keenum, Colt McCoy, Dwayne Haskins. It's going to be. Um, that wasn't even a quarterback competition, but Ryan Fitzpatrick and Taylor Heineke. <laughs> it was, yeah, it, it, it's more of a, I think, a two man race, realistically. Um, it is interesting. I mean, a guy like uh, Teddy Bridgewater is that, you know, Marty Herney took a gamble on him in uh, Carolina. Now that move got partially Marty Herney fired, but what he wanted, <laughs> how much influence does he have in the front office? Do they bring in a guy like that? Um, Jacoby Brissett. I mean, he might have options. He might, you know, you look at what Carolina is doing. It's he true. seems all kind of cornerback, uh, quarterback. So um, it'll be interesting to see how the market shakes out. Personally, I would like, selfishly for media standpoint, uh, for Taylor Heineke to come back. But I don't necessarily know, you know, Scott Turner was Heineke's guy. He was the one who advocated for him. Now that Turner is gone, does that make it less likely that Heineke's um, able to return? Well, I mean, I think Rivera respects Heineke, but. I don't know necessarily know if they would mind a fresh start there. I, I understand you, but I will say with Taylor, he always did um, give credence to the locker room and talk about how great it was. He didn't really talk all that much about the relationship with the coordinator so much. But Matthew, <laughs> I can't thank you enough for joining us this evening on this fantastic Monday evening. I hope you have a good night, sir. And I look forward to your future work. Yeah, thank you. Have a good Appreciate one, Matt. It. All yep. right, everybody. We just talk, spoke with the man, Mr. Matthew Paris. I absolutely loved it. Yes, sir. Now, well, we got to get to our fan questions to wrap this up, boys, because I'm about to go to work. I got to go to Cap One, and it's kind of bittersweet. I'm going to Cap One, and I'm doing the finishing touches. So once I leave there tonight, that's it, Thank man. Thank God. It's yeah. hard to see that material in the warehouse. Well, yeah, because you know, you're sending out the shades and everything. It's bittersweet for me, man, because I put my heart and soul into that job site, man. And it's done really well, but I hopefully everything after tonight is going to turn into service work. So um, it's unfortunate. I still got to work tomorrow morning. I worked this morning, and so I'm going to be tired as heck tomorrow morning. <laughs> but that being said, this question is from Orange Crush in the Discord chat server hall. How much do you think Dan was really behind the decision to start Wentz in that second-to-last game against the Browns? I don't think it was on Dan because I think it was more of Rivera and – well, obviously we heard Scott Turner wasn't behind the decision either. I think it was more Rivera and maybe like probably Martin Mayhew. Just uh, basically, like we said, there was a chance that they could have brought Carson Wentz back next year at a reduced price. And they, they had to see if he could go out there and be the guy. And like everyone said, if it would have worked out and he would have played well against the Browns and got us into the playoffs or whatnot, Rivera would have been looking like a genius and everything would have been – Hunky dory, but it blew up in his face, and Carson Wentz played horribly, and so here we are now in this position. 
So, uh, yeah, I think it was more Rivera and Mayhew as opposed to Dan because at the end of the day, Dan pretty much already knew he was going to be selling the team at that point or, like, at least looking into it. So, like, why would he have anything invested in Carson Wentz going forward other than other than this year if he's not even going to be around going forward? Uh, I definitely do think there was something into it. The reason why I say that, Usi, is because I, I believe that Dan Snyder w- approached them in the offseason last year and said we can't go into the offseason knowing that Taylor Heineke is the QB1. we got to add a quarterback through the draft either early on or you got to get me a veteran so we could come in here. It wasn't like he said, go get Carson Wentz, right? So then let's fast forward through the season, and everyone, literally everyone, is screaming that Carson Wentz can do what Taylor Heineke does tenfold. He can easily do it. Put him in the game, he can do it. And it's very well known that Dan Snyder listens to the fan base. This was well known back in the day that he would leak out info just to see how the fans would uh, react to it. And then he'd make a decision. I think it was uh, big with like Wade Phillips or Vic Fangio, I think was one of the cases where this happened. So in my case, it would make sense for Dan Snyder to say, hey man, we need to put Carson back in there. We tra- we, we're paying him a whole bunch. Everyone is saying that he can do what Taylor does, and we need to make the playoffs because if we do, then the guy bidding for the team will probably have more an incentive to put more money on it because he'll see the fan reaction, the fan excitement to being in the playoffs. So, yeah, I do think there was something a little bit to that. How much? I'm not sure because obviously Dan, Ron does have Dan by the balls, but I know that I know that Dan views himself as a good football person. And I'm sure that he's listening to one particular person that listens to this one site that's probably not good for his brain. But that being said, at this point, we can kind of see <laughs> the writing on the wall. And I truly believe that, that Ron did, did believe in Taylor. And that move did scratch some heads. But it did feel like there was some sort of – there was something there, right? And I'm not going to say it was Dan or it wasn't. But there was definitely some convincing going on. And uh, they chose wrong. And it's unfortunate. But – it's all right, man. It's no big deal. No no disrespect to Carson. It just didn't work out, man. And uh, I wish him the best wherever he goes. Maybe probably to Carolina with uh, Frank Reich. Now, this yeah. next question from Orange Crush. Can we still trade Payne for picks, or has that boat sailed, Hall? Um, I'm not going to say the boat has sailed, but uh, that's probably, like, the least, the least thing that I could see happening as far as, like, the franchise tag option, extended and long-term option, or like like you said, trading picks for him and then uh, whatnot. So, yeah, that would be like probably the lowest on the totem pole as far as options. Uh, I'm pretty sure the franchise tag is going to be coming down the pike. And, yeah, he'll probably get franchised and he'll be here for at least another year. Yeah, it's so that's really – hard to say because like who is going to be needing a defensive tackle so much so that they would be willing to trade for a player that's been franchise tag because you got to remember the franchise tag is essentially saying this is a one-year contract and it expires at the end and he's free to go and so who's going to that like the franchise tag is pretty much setting a baseline all right now my next contract the minimum you're going to pay me is that is if he lives up to it Exactly. In yeah. that year, right? Because he had 11 and a half sacks this year. If he comes out next year on the tag and has four, that, that's probably going to change things a little bit, oh, yeah, right? Yeah. And so um, that's why I kind of view it as he has to make – the team has to make sure that's trading for him, that he'd be willing to sign a long-term deal with them. Then they'd have to negotiate just to be able to make that trade happen. So there's a lot that goes into it. I'm not going to say it's impossible that it happens. OC. see, it certainly is possible. But if it is going to happen, it would be something along the lines for a quarterback. Um, I could see maybe something with the Ravens where to soften the blow of the draft capital. You couple um, Jerome Payne in there for Lamar. That would make sense to me. Um, but besides that, I really find it hard to believe that anybody's going to really covet that defensive tackle so much that they go out and get it. But maybe everyone's seeing the impact of Aaron Donald to Chris Jones. And they say, you know what? I want a really young, talented cat that could come in right away and have an aggressive mindset, stabilize the middle of our defense. Let's do it. And uh, that's not impossible, but I find it hard to believe given that he's going to be off in a year and they could just sign him that. But, hey, you never know, man. This next question, Hall, this is from Tim Towner. Does it make sense to clean house in 2023 of all bad contracts and give playing time to young players? For example, Leno, Fuller, Ruye, uh, Thomas, McCain, Norwell, Lucas, and McKissick. Um... That, no, some of the that some is of the taking, players that is taking that extreme like we talked about with Sam Howell, yeah. meaning like we know that like this would kind of be like a observation evaluation year. If that happened, that would be insane. 
if they yeah. l- s- cleaned house, you would, you would essentially just pretty much be tanking for Caleb Williams in 24 at that point because you're not going to get a lot of wins playing a bunch of young players like that going into 2023, especially with the schedule we have and the teams you got to play. But I mean, some of the names that you uh, rattled off, uh, I could definitely see them moving on just because of production and because of age and because of money wise cap, saving some money on the cap. But yeah, I, I can't see them going all the way in and just embracing because that would just that would pretty much be Rivera throwing in the white flag of like, yeah, I know I'm getting blown out next year. I'm a lame duck coach and whatnot. And I'm just yeah, I'm they can't do that. This year. How are they going to get exactly. fans excited to come to the games if he's like, yeah, dude, I'm exactly. out of here anyway. Kind of how exactly. like Scott Turner called games at the end of the year. Right. So, yeah, I don't see that happening be- just because not only oh, are the, the, not only would they fully embrace that, but secondly, like I said, that's not even the, like who Rivera is as a person or a coach. And thirdly, again, like you said, if you're trying to build up excitement for like the uh, new owner, I know like obviously getting rid of all the contracts and opening up a whole bunch of space up and the potential would be there for 24 for the new owner to spin big and the new coach and GM can mold the team as much as they want to and put their real put really put their fingerprint on it. But they don't, that really only works in the NBA, honestly, that really yeah, <laughs> like NBA and baseball that really, that kind of works, but you can't do that in the NFL. The, the NBA is superstar driven. As soon as exactly. you get a superstar, everything really follows through with you. If you don't have that superstar, you don't work. And it, you have to identify who that superstar is. The unfortunate part of the NBA now is they're just giving out these max contracts to everybody. So the superstar gets muddled. There really isn't that many of them, but they're all getting paid like superstars. Money you got to spend in the NBA. So just people get right. outrageous contracts that clearly don't deserve it. Right. But like, that's nonsensical. It's tyrannical. It kind of uh, is it's psychotic you could say in a sense (laughs) especially given the fact tim that two of those positions meaning cornerback and offensive line they're already weak at as it is right and so we have to be smart about it and i understand the purpose behind your question i hope you know i'm not attacking you i think you know why you asked this question and so that's why it kind of makes sense to go to logan thomas and say hey man let's talk about this let's restructure this we don't want you to leave but we can't pay you that much you don't want to leave because you know that most likely you won't be getting paid that much if you were to go to somebody else because you'd probably want to go to a winner and they probably don't have much money to give you. So well, let's, also, work, let's work something out here. That, like, are you going to go somewhere else and, like, clearly be the clear-cut number one tight end? Exactly. On the, on the team? Like, you know what I'm saying? You're, ab- you're absolutely right. So that's why it makes sense there to restructure. And then with Leno and Ruye and Cornelius Lucas and Norwell, I get that. And... I think the biggest point is that Leno obviously is brings value in the sense he played 100% of the snaps, especially given the offensive line was banged up all year. You don't want to give away consistency and stability. Regardless if you could say he was a underperforming left tackle, we could say that all day. The fact is we don't have anybody else here right now. So let's, let's retain that and let's keep that here. Chase Ruye is the big sketchy one because the unfortunate part of Chase is that when he's healthy, he's here and he's good. But the unfortunate part is that they gave him a raise and they gave him a raise so he could be injured for two years and that's never good in the business world and so i don't i wouldn't say scrap it but that is another guy i would approach regarding that bobby mccain i think proved himself this year um i'm not sure about a pay cut there but they, look they have 32 million they're gonna have to do something to wiggle themselves some more room because obviously there's some guys knocking on the door with contracts that they're gonna have to take care of and that problem is not going away my friend Last question. This is from Big Tony Shivers in the Discord chat server. What are your thoughts on Eric Bieniemy for offensive coordinator hall? I would love it. Um, yeah, like obviously, like we talked about a couple times throughout the episode, track record speaks for itself. I think that well, while it would be some risk behind it for him moving here because, like everyone stated new ownership would come in and blow everyone out mid season or just blow everyone out at at the end of the season and be like, I'm not retaining anybody. But on the flip side of that, you could also say it could benefit Eric Bannon for all the reasons that everyone's already stated before, as in he'd have full play calling, full play calling control. I mean, just look at Sean McVay. He was the play caller here for what one, two seasons and boom. Exactly. Exactly. So that would show other NFL franchises or the new ownership the, here in Washington that all right, he can he is head coaching material and he's not just a 
guy that's under Andy Reid's thumb type of thing or right. a product of, of Pat Mahomes being a ridiculously crazy superstar quarterback. So um, there's definitely good uh, – or there's risk and there's reward for it for him. But me personally, I think it would be a home run hire for this coaching staff and for the offense. And, yeah, Eric Bieniemy will be able, be able to come in, mold a guy like Sam Howe into what he wants him to be and, like, really put his thumb and his imprint on the on the uh, offense and run it how he sees fit. And, yeah, so I would love to hire, and hopefully he's uh, in the cars or in the future for the same. Yeah, there's nobody here right now, so if Eric Bieniemy wanted to come here and it happened, I would be ecstatic about it. Um, you, know you know what I would be happy for, honestly, at the end of the day? I would be happy for Terry because I feel like Terry would finally have that breakout year that – not only just we see and like people that like go up against him on the field see, but the the world, the national, the rest of the NFL world would see how much of a big a superstar well, we, we Terry can, McLaurin could be. We can hope for that. Can't guarantee it, but I know that well, Terry, yeah, Terry, regardless the of the circumstances, Terry could have Greg Roman as offensive coordinator. He still have a thousand receiving yards. Yeah, Try I'm me. Just talking about Try like, me. No. I'm talking about like the upper echelon, like the 1300, but it's still obviously still comes down to quarterback and how he plays but i think that eric bien would be able to scheme him open so much and so well that You're right i think it'd be a match made in heaven yeah and then also like with eric bien he notches all the 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 check the boxes right because when when tim towner asked us this question a long time ago a couple weeks ago you you went through the, the possible guys right and like Pat Shermer, who's somebody who doesn't have a job right now, but has the Andy Reid coaching tree, comes from the Andy Reid coaching tree, knows that offense, so it's easy to adapt it, move it over, because that Andy Reid coaching tree is fruitful, in a sense. Well, the fact is that he's had a couple years to chill, right? Eric Bieniemy is f- literally on the Super Bowl team currently, helping this with the winning football team. That automatically is a check in the box. Secondly, is that he's working with Andy Reid for the past five or six years. He's worked with a young quarterback to be able to make him explosive and, and do well, and especially given the fact he did it with Alex Smith as well. So it kind of mm-hmm. shows you that he can have the limited arm strength and give you that offense, the ability to go short, but be able to give you yak afterwards. And that's something that Washington has never really uh, had as an offensive coordinator. Our guys have really had to do that themselves. It wasn't something that was schemed, whereas you saw that with uh, Kansas City and Tyree Kill, a lot of the cases where he was getting those underneath routes and nobody could freaking catch him. Casey did such a good job at it. But you see that both sides of the spectrum with Eric bien also being young and innovative and coming from that system, you know that's an immediate. So that's why I can see somebody saying it's a dream scenario because looking at these other candidates, they're almost, they're not up to the par where they're not on a winning team that's on the Super Bowl winning team that's not calling plays and working underneath Andy Reid. And I feel like that's why Eric bien checks all of the boxes, essentially. But that's a tall task because Eric bien is going to have a choice. And I'm sure Lamar Jackson would love, would love for Eric bien to go to Baltimore to help him gonna, get their offense running. Yeah, obviously they said the Titans are going to interview him as well. He's not going to interview him. You know, he don't want to coach – Ryan Tannehill, obviously Ryan Tannehill well, is leaving, but Malik Willis. I mean, Malik's well, that's my team. that's my point about the Ravens. Also, like obviously, like I'm not even gonna put the Titans in there because, like you said, Ryan Tannehill is probably not gonna be around much longer, if not even going into next year. And Malik Willis, like he definitely ain't look like he was it yet. And, at and, least, I'll, so. and I'll only say this: I'm not saying that Sam Howell is anywhere close to the talent level of Patrick Mahomes, but the arm strength allows you to mimic some of those plays where. He, Eric bien wouldn't have to adjust his playbook. It's all I'm no. saying. I'm not doing a Gavin here. I'm not saying I see <laughs> some Joe Burrow in Kenny Pickett. I'm not say, going along those lines. All I'm saying is you can do the same things inside the playbook based on the arm strength. Yeah, no, nah, 100%. And to the Ravens' point where, obviously, like, if you're going to be able to be pick, like, the Ravens and Lamar Jackson and Washington and Sam Howe, like, nine, 10 out of 10 people are going to pick Lamar Jackson and the Ravens. But my question would be, you go to you go to Baltimore, yeah, you get to work with Lamar Jackson, but is Lamar Jackson going to be there long term? Mm. Next thing you know, you hooked you hooked your wagon to Lamar Jackson. He leaves. Now you're stuck in Baltimore. You know what? Now the, you're now you're back to square one. Like, well, do can I really call plays because my offense? Is- oh, you froze. But that's the that's the crazy thing because remember with Houston, Houston told Deshaun Watson that he could be involved with the new head coaching. Uh, search and everything like that, and then they ended up trading him. And it's funny that the Ravens said the same thing about their OC, where they're like, yeah, 
like we'll get, we'll you'll be involved in getting the new OC. Could it be a similar circumstance with Deshaun Watson, where they say, "Yeah, you're going to be involved, but we're going to ship you in a year anyway"? And maybe that's right. what happens with Lamar. I f- I felt like that was crazy. But real quick, last question I forgot. Andy Lockhart in the Discord chat. Thank you, Andy. Oi, oi. Do you think there is much there is match fixing by the NFL and referees with seriously bad calls or non calls happening in the most important of games? No, I don't think there's any max match fixing, any rigging of games from referees like it's just one of them games where everything's happening so fast and like literally like people said many a times over the years you can call holding on offensive linemen on every single play in an NFL game it's just a matter of is it egregious or not and again there's so much stuff going on in the football field people are flying around like fast as hell like obviously you're not going to get every single call you're going to have some bad calls obviously so Yes, the refereeing should and could be better, but at the end of the day, no one's perfect. They're still human beings. Like, no, no one's ever going to get every single call right or or correct or incorrect. So, it is what it is. It sucks that it always has seems to happen in like the biggest moments, but I mean, it is they're they're not even full time referees. So you know, like these are normal guys that like have normal jobs in the off season. So yeah, it, it, this for, is what happens. Yeah, Andy, I don't think the match fixing is going on. I don't take it seriously. I know that there's people in there who find that there's a lot of smoke to that fire, and I obviously get it. So let's look at the Philly game, right? What happens with that Devontae Smith catch? That's on Kyle Shanahan. That's on the NFL. The NFL is not going to say, "Hey, you should exactly. challenge that, bro." <laughs> right. What's What's going to happen is Philly will show it on the jumbotron, and I could see Philly going, "Hey." Don't show that review. Let us get up to the hike. And I could, because Philly does crap like that. They are very shysty in that aspect. So I could definitely see the people in the stadium saying, don't put the review up there because we don't want Kyle uh, Kyle Shannon to challenge it. That I could see happening. The other, I've, I saw one conspiracy theory. Look, I'm a conspiracy theory guy. I love theorizing I because I find it to be a fun exercise. Now, you have to be able to follow the breadcrumbs to be able to match your theory to honestly believe it, but that's where the separation between psychotic and the normal are, right? <laughs> but So back in the day, like in 2012, I saw somebody wrote how they thought the NFL was fixed because Doug Baldwin, as he's diving into the end zone, has his thumb up, and they're saying that he's telling the defender to go high so he can jump under them. And I'm like, son, do you know how fast a play is happening? Like, do you really <laughs> honestly believe that he's telling him in a th- split second to jump over him? Come on, bro. What are we doing they here? Would, that would have to be, like, literally, like, okay, so at in the third quarter at the 456. Exactly. Minute, we're gonna how, hit, how do we're you gonna know you're going to be on play. the goal line? <laughs> right. We're going to run this play, right. and we're going to dive on the goal line, and we're going to have this player dive at you. Like, no, man, this is not, no, like, but I, this is not a movie. This is not Varsity Blues. Yeah, and on. I understand the whole aspect of the gambling industry being in this, and the, the referees obviously having a lot to do with it. We could sit here and say, look at what happened with the Giants. We, we, they literally stole points from us, took game, points out of our mouths and said, screw you guys, we got it wrong, ha <laughs> And that's what they left us with. But the fact is, I don't believe that to be the case. I didn't believe it then, I don't believe it now. The, the Vegas wants to make money, of course, but of course they're going to throw out nonsensical crap like saying Tom Brady is 3-0 and against the Cowboys and stuff because the, the, the ignorant fan, the guy that doesn't want, follow football but wants to talk about football with his friends at work that bets, he's probably going to bet on that. Exactly. And that's who they're trying to get. It's not that the, exactly. everything is, is fixed. It's just the fact that they're smart in the way that they go about business. And that's not the way the case for the refs, unfortunately. A lot of the time it comes down to common sense issues regarding some of these um, flags and they don't have it. They go strictly by the books. They're lawyers, yeah. and that's what they do. They go strictly by the book. There is no common sense to the the law of sport and knowing what what should be happening and what shouldn't, right? And that's that's just my personal opinion. But uh, all right, everybody, that's going to wrap us up for this episode. I appreciate you guys. Unfortunately, that Reed couldn't be here. He finally hit us up, and he <laughs> said, oh, my, my phone's messing up. I won't be there yet, but... I appreciate you guys for stopping by, uh, for supporting us, for contributing. As always, uh, thank you to Yam Starch always for helping us in the Discord. Tony Shivers, Orange Crush, Tim Towner, Andy Lockhart. You guys are the best. Appreciate y'all. We'll see you on Thursday, hopefully with a full crew and our prospect breakdown for the NFL Draft. So if there, you have any prospects you want to hear about next week, let us know. And uh, we'll on Thursday, we'll make sure to do prospect breakdowns for you guys. All right, everybody. I'm Kyle. I'm Hall. And I'm on my way to Cap 1, unfortunately. It's bittersweet. Uh, All right, everybody. Washington football. Woo!
you do. Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Kyle. I just wanted to say thank you so much for watching. And if you liked what you saw, make sure you hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way you get notified when anything new is uploaded to the channel. Also, we just launched theburgundyzone.com. You can go there and find all of our latest news, articles, and the latest episodes that are uploaded. Again, we also have the Discord chat server, where all of our VIP folks are in, like Andy Burroughs, Scott Hartley, Sergio Martin is in there as well. Don't miss out on the Discord chat server. Go and check that out. Until next time, everybody, watching the football. Woo!